Uh, great. Let's get started today. Thanks everyone for coming on this lovely freezing uh, Wednesday morning. Um, anybody have any questions on projects? Stuff we've covered so far before we get started today? Uh, how many submissions do we actually get? Not this one, test one. Fifteen. One five, okay. Yeah, one five. So it's actually a good point. So I did, um, I'll announce it on the mailing list. Uh, let's see, what's, there we go. Uh, so I did implement the tests, the smoke test, or the actual submission and all the tests for part two. Um, it took quite longer than I was expecting, uh, but I guess that's the way it goes. Um, so you can submit this smoke test as a real test, right? Any of your smoke tests, so you should see that it actually, you know, passes compilation before you actually submit it, otherwise you're just burning a submission, right? Um, so I can submit it as real, and it says it successfully transferred it uh, for homework one part two, so I have 11 submissions remaining of 15. Um, and then I can see, why are they not yet created? I think I deleted some of them for myself. Uh, hopefully this will work. Uh, you know. If you have problems, please let me know. Um, if you have problems with the test cases, so this one was a, as I said, part two was kind of really difficult to write. There's actually like 40 things that have to happen just to test like 10 test cases, because I have to add things to files and then run your program to make sure those things are in the files and that the output's correct and um, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so ah, here we go. So this submission got 62 points. Um, it's actually not mine, but I won't tell you whose it is. It's one of yours. Um, so yeah, so it'll give you the output. So it should give you, if you failed the test case, it'll give you the name. It'll give you, you know, how much that test case was worth. And then it'll give you the standard out and the standard error from your program execution. Um, so you should be able to use this to figure out where there were any problems um, or where there were any you know, exceptions. Ooh, that's not good. That may be something I could so anyways, so yeah, be, you know, let me know things, let me know how things are going. Um, should we good, any questions? I'll work on part three, hopefully get that done today or tomorrow. So, yes. It's getting kind of tight. Can we maybe have an extra couple of days? Turn that in? I don't know, you already had two, two weeks. Right? Well, yeah, exactly, but we haven't had a chance to test it against the test cases, and they're gonna be broader than, you have a lot more knowledge of the material than we do, so we'll be learning while we submit test cases. We're gonna need time. It's a good advocate right there. <laughs> uh, I'll consider it, I'll consider it. Right now I'm leaning towards not, because uh, you know the purpose of this is to basically so that you can know your grade beforehand. The alternative, and what you do in a lot of classes, is you just submit the code and then I run it on test cases, and then you get points knocked off for missing my test cases, but you never get a chance to know about it, so I'll but consider. probably have the requirements a little more poorly defined. I mean, we're kind of getting some requirements as we go. Correct. Yeah. And uh, some of them have been subtly inconsistent. So. <laughs> all right, well, we, we should uh, get out all those inconsistencies. So that's, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk. Maybe on Monday, closer to the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it Monday's the deadline? Yeah. It's close to the deadline, right? Maybe, uh, what is it? 10 hours to the deadline? That's pretty close. Other questions? Yeah. Can you, can you speak about it? Can I do what? Count? I don't understand. You're basically asking if I can give you the what the test case is looking for. The answer is definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> like no, the, that's the whole point is you don't know exactly what it's expecting, right? I mean, the name of it should tell you what it's testing for. Um, the output will probably not help you too much in this case because no, you should you don't get you know that's the whole point, right? You don't. I'm changing the environment, I'm running your program, and based on my tweaks to the environment, I expect changes in the output of your program. But it's not like we said, right? So there's no, it doesn't have to be in a specific order or anything like that. So, um, you know, I erred on the side of 
latency as far as uh, um, leniency as far as uh, testing, like the tests. So, any other questions? standard if you look at any SSH key, right? The last, the comment field is usually host or user at host, right? To me, that's so used by almost every key generating software that you want to grab that information. Do you want us to that in all these keys and you'd be like, I need that information. 
because that specifically is tied, like this whole thing is about SSH, right? So that is tied and says, hey, there's a user at this machine at that host. I know this key's in here, so I have a pretty good idea that this exists, so I should use that information. So if you were a student working on this assignment, mm -hmm. how would you get a lot of examples of that you know, host file? You don't, I mean, it's a use thing, right? But it's gotta be used, and you keep it on there. That's true. Uh, you find out about it by us talking about it right now. And then you go look for examples of SSH public keys, right? There's, because uh, that's basically what, I mean, the standard, uh, well, known to host is one thing, right? But the, um, the authorized key file, right, is all public keys. So you can Google for public keys, that kind of stuff. Um, you can find a lot of, you know, public keys are public, right? They don't have to be private. So uh, you can find a lot of examples. Other questions? So let's go on. So we've looked at uh, we've looked at some local area network attacks, right? We've looked at some ARP attacks, how we can poison the ARP cache in order to try to intercept or hijack traffic between two hosts in our local network. Um, we may also want to spoof the I, an IP packet. So what does what does spoofing mean again? What does that mean? What, what's our goal here? Yeah, we want to impersonate, right? We want to send an IP packet that actually comes from us, but we say it comes from somebody else. Is there anything that prevents us from doing this from what we looked at on IP and lower layers like ARP and Ethernet? Impersonate uh, some other host, uh, let's say host 76, uh, we can actually create that and send that packet, right? We have to encapsulate that in an, in an, um, in an Ethernet frame, right? In an Ethernet packet. And we need to make sure that the destination, the to, is correct for that IP address. Uh, what, do we, what can we do with the from? Can it be from us? Process it, right? Uh, 
so we use the the from IP address here, and we're actually able to spoof um, to spoof that home. Yeah. So we need to encapsulate that in there. So why would we want to use IP spoofing? Be useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can get the data that uh, someone else would have received, and you you might have interest in knowing what that data is. Ooh. So what happens when, in this case, right? So just just talking about ARP spoofing, right? So we don't um, let's say we're not doing any ARP poisoning, <coughs> any ARP, oh. ARP attacks, right? So here, what happens when host fourteen tries to reply to this message? sends out a packet with uh, the IP address and this machine address which it came from in Why? How does it know how to, how, so first let's take it by steps, right? So mm -hmm. first, what's the IP address it's gonna try to respond to? Uh, 0.76. 0.76, right, exactly. Um, and then how does it know how to create an ethernet packet to reply to that? Uh, so, it, it has a destination MAC address also inside the packet, which it will use as well. Oh. Uh, it doesn't use that at all, right? It just uses that to receive it at the Ethernet layer. It goes away, right? It doesn't oh, really yeah. ever need it again. Right? It's just exactly the same sequence of steps that happens if this machine wants to contact that host, right? To make that reply. So what's it first going to check? If it has the the yeah, exactly. It's going to check the cache, right, and say, do I know the MAC address for 76? Uh, let's say we're not doing any poisoning or any games, right? Mm -hmm. So that the address of 76 is going to be some other, the actual physical MAC address of that machine, assuming it exists on the network, right? And then it's going to say, okay, let's send out that packet on the network. Is that going to come to us? No, right? So is this useful if we can't get the reply? Shaking your head, yes, why? But the, if there is no. Wait, wait, let's go right here. Hold on. I think an example would be that I can send a derogatory message to uh, one of the higher positions in the company, and that person might fire the other person because he has the proof that it came from the company. Tricky. A what kind of message? Say it again. A derogatory message. A what? A derogatory message. An email message, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you could. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because we haven't gotten to the upper layers, but yeah, you could basically, essentially you're impersonating that machine, right? So it seems like it came from that other machine. Uh, more technically, if we look at some of the, uh, some protocols are request reply, right? So if this is a DNS response, so somebody makes a DNS request for, hey, what's the ad IP address for google.com? And we reply before the DNS server, and we impersonate the DNS server and say, hey, yeah, that's my my IP address, it's 111, 10, 20, 121, right? Now when they try to go to google.com, they're actually gonna go to our machine. So then we can do like an active man in the middle attack. Um, we can impersonate an NFS server, we can do uh, kind of, this is kind of similar to the Kevin Mitnick attack where we maybe could try to do, uh, execute some commands on the server. Um, so if there's some higher level protocol that uses IP address in order to do authentication, right? So that it's checking the IP address and says, I trust this IP address. Well, you know, that doesn't mean that that actually came from that other IP address, right? Because we can inject packets on the network as if we were that IP address. Um, there's lots of tools to do this, to do DNS spoofing, all kinds of stuff. Um, HPing is a tool to, it's a ping-like interface to impersonate an IP. And so you could do this yourself and well, talk about that in a second, but, um, so there's actually libraries to do this. So how do you actually do this IP spoofing, right? Does your operating system allow you to do this by default? No? Yeah, it doesn't like you to pretend to be other people, right? You have a well-defined series of interfaces, the socket library, right? Um, but it will allow you, if you have advanced privileges, it will allow you to create arbitrary ethernet or IP address packets and send those out on the network. Um, so LibNet is one of these libraries and it provides uh, a way, it's a C library, 
so that you can actually write a program to build and inject arbitrary packets into the network. So you can write, you know, you can spoof Ethernet frames, and this is really how all of those other tools are written, like uh, Ettercap and HPing, right? They're using this library, and this allows you to do this very easily. Um, so you first, you know, you initialize the packet, you initialize the network, you can construct a packet, um, you calculate the checksums on the packet, right? That's an important thing if you're doing this by yourself. The OS is not going to do it for you. So you have to manually calculate the checksum. And then you can actually inject it onto the wire. I've actually debated uh, your next project, one of the projects will involve doing this and spoofing packets uh, on, on the network. Uh, I will say LibNet is horrible from my experience with it. Like it is one of the most poorly documented piece of crap C libraries that I've ever had to use. And so I was like, do I want to force the students to also go through what I went through? <laughs> um, I think no, I'm leaning much towards no because there's such a better library now. So uh, Scappy is a Python library to do this. And if you have, you know, an afternoon or a few hours to mess around and you want to play around with network stuff, Scappy is absolutely the way to go and the thing to learn and understand. Like it is insane how useful it is to create packets and IP packets and Ethernet packets. Um, so you can kind of quickly prototype what you want to do. Uh, it's obviously, it can sniff. So it can sniff on the network. You can set a function that gets called every time a packet comes in that matches some parameters. It allows you to spoof and create packets. Uh, it's obviously slower than PCAP and LibNet, right? Because it's running in Python, so it's actually, I assume, I have to assume it's actually using these libraries underneath, right? So there's all those translations. Um, but you can do super cool stuff like, hey, send a spoofed ICMP packet. And it's just like one line of Python code, <laughs> which is absolutely insane compared to the LibNet nonsense you have to do. You're going to let us use a library this time? <laughs> yes, this time I think I will. Well, the other one's a library, but I'll let, I think I'll let you choose either Scappy or LibNet, but me and the TAs are coming up with some cool packet twiddling things that we can do, so it should be very interesting. Okay, so these are kind of the libraries that you can use to actually write code to do these cool tricks. Um, so we talked about sniffing, spoofing, What's hijacking? Do we talk about hijacking? What does it mean? I mean playing a video game like GTA and you steal somebody's car. <laughs> Is that what we're talking about? I'm not going to teach you how to. Taking control over someone else's device. Not necessarily a device. We're not quite there yet. But um, that's one way you could talk about it. Yeah. Taking control over the session. Yeah, so you want to actually take control yeah, of the session, or you want to uh, be able to sniff and spoof and be able to inject some data into the conversation between two hosts. Right? So rather than just reply to something, or send a request for something, or try to poison something, right, you can actually manipulate the conversation between two hosts. Uh, so the idea is you sniff the network, so you're listening to all the packets that are going, you wait for a client request, right? you wait for an HTTP request, a DNS request, um, and then when you see that, your goal is to be faster than the other machine yeah. and send a response all back on the network. And so we're going to see uh, you know, ART-based, we're going to see UDP-based hijacking, TCP-based variations of this attack. Each of them require something a little bit different, right? So we've kind of already seen this, right? I, ARP, ARP poisoning is kind of in some sense a hijacking because we're sending these requests. Um, we could. We could listen to them, right? We could listen for broadcast requests and then reply with ours right away um, and hope that it gets there quickly, or we can just kind of flood the network, which is what we saw. But to understand how we have to do that, right, we want to first, okay, we talked about local networks. Now we're going to take it one step up and say, okay, how, how did the packet get, if we want to talk to a machine that's not in our local network, what actually happens? Right, so indirect delivery, would mean not on our local subnet, right? We want to actually talk to a different machine, which is really how we get the internet, right? It's not just we're all on a big local area network subnet where you can just send out packets. Right, you have to have some way for the packets to get there. So 
IP is where this works. So the basic idea is if I want to send a packet to another machine in another network, um, I use IP and I deliver it to what we call the gateway. So the idea is the gateway is a machine in your local subnet who knows how to get outside and talk to other subnets, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we'll see how this is set up on the machines. Um, and so it's the gateway's idea, the gateway then has to decide what do I do with this packet? Who do I send this to, right? If you think about your home setup, right? Often you'll have a router at home. Mm -hmm. And so if you're transferring a file or something between two machines on your local subnetwork, Right? They just use Ethernet or Wi-Fi to talk to each other, and it goes through the router, right? but they're just talking to each other. But once you want to talk to Google.com or somebody outside your local network, well, then you send the packet to your router, and the router goes, oh, this isn't for the local network. It's for outside. Let me send it along the cable line or whatever to the next hop, which will be somebody at, uh, what is it, Comcast or Cox, whatever we have here, or ASU, I guess, if you're on the ASU network. <coughs> and then when that next machine gets it, right? It gets the packet, and now it has to decide where to go. It's usually not a I mean, machine high level term, right? Usually like a switch or some kind of router. So it gets a packet, and it needs to know where to go. And hopefully, you're getting closer and closer to your destination, right? Where you actually want to go, until you finally reach a subnet where a gateway is on the same subnet as the host you want to talk to. And then it says, okay, now I, need, now I know exactly where this goes. And then we use the exact thing that we talked about already. Right? Kind of makes sense. Right? We need to, so this is where we think of as hops, right? We're hopping, hopping along, our packet's hopping along. Uh, do we have any guarantees about that our packet's ever going to get there? Do we have any guarantees that it's going to take the most efficient route possible? The fastest route, the least latency? Why? What kind of things may affect that? I guess in that case, if the route, if the machine fails, then the other route is the best route, right? Yeah. In some sense. What well, else? That's one of the reasons. Yeah. So if there's mechanical failure, right? We definitely want to be able to route around that. Oh, uh, network traffic. What's that? Network traffic. Network traffic in what sense? Like, uh, if there is a huge uh, communication going between the closest distance network, uh, we it may might go need to go. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it could be that there is actually a shorter in hops route, right, between us and our destination. But maybe that link is very saturated, so we actually go around that. So we take more hops, but hopefully it's faster. Uh, what about slower? Can it ever be just a straight up, longer, slower route? See some people shaking their heads. Why? It might be for the security purpose, like a hacker is like a person who is just watching one of the line, and you can send half of the packet to the another line. So. Uh, okay, a hacker, kind uh, of. Not the hacker, but a black guy. Uh, dark, uh, black hat guy. Yeah, black hat. Um, Sorry. Yeah, there was actually cases where I think people were looking at network traces and they saw that traffic coming from Russia to another country would actually go through some servers in like Virginia and then go down there. Which is not the most efficient route, but it put it on US soil, so maybe somebody could intercept that. But I, I don't know, that's just a theory. So yeah, that's definitely one thing. How do, how do the the big backbone networks, right? The Verizons, how do they decide where traffic goes? Yeah. So a lot of them depends on the DNS infrastructure of the internet itself. Like, how, how do the routers know which router should I choose if they have their own? Routing protocol. Yeah, so routing protocol, so there's a protocol BGP where they decide and they announce routes. That's what the backbone uses. DNS goes something to do with it if you're at different local addresses. Uh, there's one big thing that we're all, we're all yeah. not talking about, right? The cable itself. Sorry. It's money. It's money, right? So these big organizations like Verizon, AT&T, these big backbone providers, right? They charge each other money to access each other's network. So Cox or ASU could decide, hmm, I know the shortest route is through level three, but man, they're charging me a lot of money for traffic this month, so let's actually send it to another host and let them deal with it that's actually cheaper. Um, so they can actually sometimes play games like that, and your traffic can go a non-optimal route just because they don't want to pay. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, when you get to that high level, it's actually much more of like a political economic decision rather than just a technical decision of what's the quickest way I can get there. Uh, at, each, at each hop, how do we, uh, how does it decide which direction to go? Good question. 
So here's a diagram that I clearly messed up a little bit in coloring. Um, so the idea is we have a system here, dot 21. We, we want to send a packet over to a whole another network at what is it? Uh, dot 10. So do we know from this? So do we know from this that we're on different subnets? What's missing from here for to tell me that we're on different subnets? What was that? Yeah. Yeah, the, the subnet mask, right? For something that tells me exactly what the subnet is, right? Uh, we can assume from these addresses they're very different, so they're you know highly likely to be on different subnets, right? It's so the idea is I want to send a packet from 121 all the way over to dot 10, right? So the first thing my machine does is it looks and it says, is 128.111.41.10 on my local subnet? No, right? Definitely not. And so then it says, okay, where do I put this packet? So we're gonna look at, it actually has a table, each of, the, each of your machines, right, has a table in it that says exactly where packets should go. So if it goes to this network, it goes over here. If it goes to this other network, it goes over here. Um, and so the idea is it would say, hey, if you want to send you know, packets to 121, or if you want to send packets out of the network, you have to send a packet to like this either address is the, uh, or IP address either way. This machine is the, the gateway. So this is how you get out. And then this router has a rule that says, hey, if a packet's coming for my, if I get a packet, if its destination is to my internal subnetwork, then I know where to send it. Otherwise, if it's for another network, I send it out over here. And so, so basically the idea is each of these switches in between each have a table that tells them exactly where to route packets. Um, so some of the things we've kind of talked about, right? So the, the source and destination IP address always stay the same, right? That's kind of the point. If we just want to get our piece of mail from us to the destination and we want it, and we don't care what hops it takes or whatever, but that's, that information better be exactly the same, right? Uh, what was the TTL? What did the TTL field stand for? What was it? <laughs> Time to live. Yeah, which is kind of a very strong term. Um, so every hop along this way, we're going to decrement that TTL field. And if we ever get to zero, we'll stop, right? Because we don't want it to be the case where our packets are just going through the network, just creating a cycle here because there's a problem, and now the network's down because our packets are living forever. So the other key thing is that the Ethernet packet, right, at each stage, the Ethernet level completely changes, right? Because we have, at the first step, we have our machine, which is, what is it, A, A, B, C, D, E, F, and you can see the A's and the B's, that means two, I said it longer. Um, and at the first step, we want to talk to this switch, specifically, right? A0, B0, C0, D0, E0, F0 because we know that's the gateway. So we have to encapsulate our IP packet in an Ethernet packet destined for our local host, and then when they get it, they take off that IP, that Ethernet layer, keep the IP packet, repackage it in another Ethernet to get to the next hop, and at every step along the way, they do that. Um, so that when it finally gets here, the packet that dot 10 receives doesn't, have a, doesn't know our source Ethernet address. Right? Because they don't care. They can't talk to us over Ethernet. They can only talk to us over IP. So it doesn't matter what our source Ethernet address is. And the delivery process, it says it's based on the destination address only. Uh, technically, it's just based on the destination address. That's the only thing each of the switches look at. Uh, it's obviously also based on all kinds of crazy rules. Um, so if we want to get this packet, right, this uh, packet from 111, 10, 20, 121, uh, to 128, 11, 41, 10. Uh, then we first create it here, right? And so this Ethernet frame, like we said, right, is going to have the source and destination. The source is our Ethernet. The destination has the, the gateways. And then at every packet along the way, that's going to be changed, right? So that when it gets here, the Ethernet frame here source is from the gateway and the destination is the destination Ethernet. So 
So questions on how kind of routing works at a high level? to when my laptop is plugged in, I can talk to you on your wireless you know, address. Uh, and on a wire, you know, if you're on wireless, you can talk to Google because all those steps in between, they're each, everybody knows how to talk on their specific addresses, on their specific physical uh, local subnets. Uh, one yeah. question. So what mm -hmm. if uh, two different routers have two different length limits for an IP packet would they? Ah, so yeah, we're going to get into that. So yeah, one of the things to think about, right? So this is at a, a very high level, right? But we talked about how big can an IP packet be? 65,000 65, bytes, right? Really large. So what happens if one of these physical links actually can't support that? What happens then? Yeah, we'll look at it. That was more rhetorical. Um, so there's a couple different types of routing that we've seen. So the Basically, the standard is hop by hop, right? So each switch decides where to route the packet. Um, so every switch, every gateway decides where the packet goes. You have absolutely no router control. Router, not switch. Uh, router, yeah. Well, it's really just a matter of terminology is if it's a gateway or not a gateway, right? I can have a, uh, oftentimes, for various circumstances, you may want an actual machine, like a server, to be the gateway, right? Yeah. And to route packets or something like that. Or you know, this may be a gateway, but these are actually all switches, and then this is considered a gateway or a router. I kind of use them kind of interchangeably. Um, yeah. They're yeah, they're very similar. So I guess the yeah, I mean, the, I guess the big difference, right, is I guess a router is a switch that has a default route. Right, so if it gets an IP address on the subnet, they can throw it up. Switch is in layer two. Okay, so normal type of routing is you have no control, right? The gateways and switches in between, they decide. Uh, the other way is source routing. So we saw, remember, when we were talking about IP, that IP can actually has an option where that you, the sender of the packet, can specify where the packet goes and what hops it takes. Um, and this can lead to attacks, which is actually, I think we talked about it kind of briefly. Um, so we can do this, right? If we can control that, well, we can try to force a host to, uh, we can force traffic through specific routes, and maybe we can put ourselves in the middle of that traffic and say, you know, hey, let's try to, uh, when I talk to this other machine, always go through me or go through a thing I control. Um, so if, you know, in the case of what we were talking about with IP spoofing, right, if when they reply, they use the same route that I told them of how to contact me, right, then when they reply back to me, it's actually going to come to me, right? So I can actually um, impersonate a lot easier. Uh, but this is kind of more of a historical fact. Um, it's, but it does go to an idea, and one of the important things and why we talk about it is that uh, this is kind of a key flaw that will come up over and over again, right? So we should never trust the sender of a packet to specify the correct thing, right? Like, we have, when we get a packet, we have no trust over the source route. We have no trust over the IPs, right? Over the MAC addresses, right? We can see that 
the attacker can control all of those things on their own machine, right? Uh, I can't control your, you know, what, what the output is of your packet, but I can control the output of mine. Uh, so if I can use that to some detriment, like in this case, to get traffic routed through me or to specify it and to be able to attack things, uh, it becomes a huge problem. Okay, so to do hop by hop routing, we need to maintain every one of these devices in between, whether they're hosts or switches or routers or gateways, uh, they have to have a routing table. Uh, so you can check out the routing table on your Linux machines or on, um, on any kind of Linux based machine by using the route command, so route dash n. Uh, I will say on a Mac, you can't use route, it doesn't have route, you have to use <coughs> Uh, netstat, and I believe you can do the same thing with netstat dash r for the route, and then you can also do dash n so it will not print out the, um, not try to do reverse DNS. Uh, so that's all this dash n does. Um, so it just shows you a table of destination, gateway, mask, flags, and the interface. So the idea is, um, so it'll look something like this. Um, so basically what this means is, so the gen mask, right, is the subnet mask is what we were looking at. So this means, hey, if I get a packet for 192.168.1.24 for exactly that address, then I can just go ahead and send that out on ethernet zero. I don't have to do any other processing, any lookup, I just always do that. Uh, this line basically says anything destined for 192.168.1.0. Uh, so what's the dot zero? Can we have a zero in our IP addresses? Yeah, so with that with the gen mask, right, we can see with the net mask, a uh, subnet mask, we can see that this means any packet that is destined for any host in 192.168.1, right, that has this as the, as the prefix, then I know I can send it out on Ethernet zero, right? What does the gateway as zero mean? As all zeros. Uh, no, so it means no gateway. So I don't actually need a gateway here because it's on my local, yeah, it's an Ethernet, right? It's in my subnet. So I don't need to use any kind of, um, I don't need to use a gateway at all. And I know where to send it, right? I know to send it out on Ethernet zero. What about this third line? Does this look familiar? Yes. It sends to the local, uh, we loop back interface. Local host? Yeah, so any packet destined for, but isn't local host 127.001? Yeah. What does this match? What was that? Anything else that's not on the routing table. Uh, that's the last line, but this fourth line, or third line here, this line. Yeah. So does it match 127.001? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What else does it match? Anything else? Anything, anything that starts with 127? Yes, anything, anything that starts with 127. So actually, if you look up the RFCs, right, I actually should have looked this up, but um, I believe the RFC says any IP address that starts with 127, right, no matter what comes afterwards, they're all mean your local machine. Uh, so actually you can get around some attacks. Uh, you can actually do some attacks with that knowledge. Uh, the basic idea is like if a remote machine will fetch some content from another, another server, like, uh, uh, what's an example? Oh, like when you submit maybe like a tweak or something, right? And it goes out and fetches that URL and then shows you like a picture that's there or some content. Um, oftentimes it can be tricked. You can probe that machine to see what other ports are open on that machine. Mm -hmm. If you use, if you tell it to try to fetch 127.001, right? The local host, then you can specify ports in there to get local hosts with different ports. Um, so you can kind of get it to scan itself. Uh, oftentimes programmers will block that and say, okay, block 127001 without realizing that actually you can pass any 127 address there and it will work just the same. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another bypass. And we can see here, right? We know it goes on the local interface. There's nothing special really about that except that it's in the routing table. 
right? If we got rid of this routing table, we'd probably try and actually do something and send that packet out. So then what's this last one? Yeah, right? So the zeros here in the destination and the gen mask is all zeros means it's a catch-all. It's a default. It matches everything. Um, so this says, hey, if you get a, if you, if it doesn't match any of these rules, right? So it's on first matching in the rules. Um, so if it doesn't match any of these rules, then by default, send it out to 192.168.1.1 on the interface Ethernet zero. Um, and the flags tell us a little bit something more about there. The U flag tells us that that route is up. Uh, G says that it's a gateway. H says it's a route. Um, and then D and M tell us if it was done by any, if it was modified at all. So you can do this. It's really, uh, you know, it's a good exercise to practice kind of uh, looking at your computer, seeing if it makes sense for these routes. Um, you can do kind of complicated routing things, which can be pretty cool. Um, so yeah. Um, and so the idea is you first search for a, an exact match, right? So you kind of use the, the tree as, or the those rules as output, and you're trying to match more specific to more generic, right? So you first try to match any hosts, right? Does this match somebody I know about explicitly? And then you go, does it match any addresses? And there you go from specific to general. Uh, then do I have a default entry? Um, and then if no match is found, right? It could be the case that you don't have a route for that. You don't know how to send that packet out. Um, then either you will return it, your machine will tell you that there's that you can't reach that host, or the gateway will tell you, hey, I don't know how to reach this host. This is not, not a domain or not a uh, IP range I know about. Um, so you can either set, you know, you can set these routes, you can do it statically. Um, the route command is the kind of older style, the new one is the IP command. So you can say IP route and then you can specify things. Um, the big guys do it dynamically, right? It would be kind of crazy if you were in there statically doing all these things. So there's all kinds of protocols for how you Determine and broadcast routes so that way Verizon knows, right? So if you think about it, you only know, need to know about how traffic goes around in your network, right? If you only have one gateway, it's really easy. When you get to the level of ASU, when they have multiple peers, well, how do I know how to match IP addresses to which peer, where do I send this? Um, so there's a whole, so their tables are a lot bigger, right? Because they have a lot bigger addresses. So uh, there's a whole protocol about how to do that. Cool. All right, so we will, let's stop here. Uh, on Friday, we'll get into blind IP spoofing. So who made blind IP spoofing famous? Kevin Mitnick. So this was the attack that he used on the San Diego supercomputer center. Uh, and we'll see that's actually really, really cool. So, thanks.